And then we're going to turn to Emily O'Brien, who joins us this evening um, from her role as Policy and Partnerships Manager at the Brightman Cove Food Partnership, which is a local non-profit organisation which helps people to learn to cook, to eat healthy diets, to grow their own food and to eat and to waste less food. So I think Emily will be able to give us a perspective of how these, these issues are manifesting in our own backyard, or at least the backyard of this university and of IDS, and bring a really local and kind of policy practice everyday perspective to these big global challenges. So I think we've got a fantastic debate in store. Um, each of our presenters, we're going to have about eight minutes to talk to you. We're going to take the presentations in a row and then we'll open up to Q&A from the audience and also from our live stream audience who will also have the opportunity to ask questions which will be relayed by our colleagues here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Olivia to kick off set the stage for us. Okay, so good evening to all and I shall be I shall be delighted to uh, say a few words about, first of all, the diagnosis of the, the issue and why it is that the question of sustainability and food systems have become such a source of concern. My diagnosis is the following. It is that since the 1950s, um, as exemplified by the Common Agricultural Policy in Europe, we've been focusing on one key objective, which is to produce large amounts of calories by techniques and policies that allow uh, to feed a growing population with uh, a demand for food products that is increasing even faster than the population itself is growing, um, and that we have neglected the other objectives of food systems. Uh, and as a result, we've developed what I would like to call a, a low-cost food economy that is very costly for the communities, very costly in many regards given the social costs imposed by the way we produce and consume food, but that is meant to be affordable for poor consumers. And indeed, the portion of the household budgets that go to food have been uh, diminishing uh, regularly since the 1950s, with about 12-13% uh, of the family income today being spent on food, when it was about 30% in the immediate um, um, post-Second World War period. How have we done this? Well, by paying um, low prices to farmers for their produce, although this is partly compensated by the subsidies that they receive, by supporting large farms capable of achieving economies of scale and um, subsidized in their access to fossil energies and by um, not imposing on food producers that they internalize the social and environmental costs of how they produce food. The problem, however, is that as a result of these choices made some 50, 60 years ago, um, a number of impacts have been underestimated. And I'd like to mention three in particular. Um, the first are environmental. The ways we've um, produced food over the past 50 years are now leading to significant environmental impacts. 12% um, of greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture and about 30% from food systems as a whole. Moreover, the development of monocultures on a large scale has resulted in the loss of biodiversity and uh, in very serious and problematic impacts on the health of soils that are less equipped than they were in the past to function as carbon sinks and instead have become net emitters of greenhouse uh, gases. So environmental impacts are very important linked to industrial food production. Secondly, we have social impacts, um, by which I mean that we have an increased uh, dualization of farming between a small number of successful farms that have achieved a significant economy of scale and are quite uh, 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 competitive on large markets, but a large number of small farms that are actually rapidly disappearing. In Europe, for example, over the past 30 years, 
we've lost about two thirds of our farms. And the UK is a case in point. The UK is one uh, country which is almost the, the most unequal as regards uh, access to land uh, for farmers with uh, um, a very significant proportion of uh, the, the arable land that is in the hands of a small number of extremely large farms coexisting with small family farms that are, again, disappearing very rapidly. In addition, social impacts are felt by all workers in the food systems that are being exploited to produce this low-cost food. And then, thirdly, um, we have health impacts that are going to weigh more and more heavily in the future on the healthcare systems of industrial countries and are already weighing also on the healthcare systems of countries such as South Africa, uh, China, India, and of course Mexico, that is uh, uh, second uh, uh, after the US, uh, the most affected by the growth of obesity rates across um, the world. And obesity is largely linked to how people eat, what people uh, eat, and particularly to diets that have been increasingly um, um, uh, rich in the use of processed uh, or ultra-processed foods uh, rather than uh, fresh foods that are cooked um, uh, within, um, within families. So these are some of the problems we encounter. And there is a large understanding of these problems, a large consensus around these issues, yet the system is resistant to change. And if we ask ourselves why this is so, um, I think one answer is to say that the systems that have developed over the past 50, 60 years um, have led to a number of pathways being um, uh, developed, technological, economic, uh, political, cultural pathways that have become mutually supporting and that form together now a system that is very resistant to change. Because any single piece of the system is supported by all the other pieces to which it has been connected and with which uh, it has co-evolved over the years. So for example, we've developed uh, infrastructures, um, uh, technologies, uh, research and development uh, investments by large companies that have been supportive of industrial production of cheap calories on a very large scale. That has led to some economic actors emerging that are the champions of this low-cost food economy that are able to squeeze outside of food systems all um, uh, competition that might emerge at a smaller scale and that capture most of the subsidies and most of the support that is going um, to research and development programs in particular. Um, these big actors, these champions of the food systems as they have developed, can say quite plausibly that they are responding to a, a demand of the public, a demand that itself has been shaped by the supply of processed foods, convenience foods, um, uh, particularly since the 1960s as more women went to join the workforce, uh, achieving, which is of course welcome, economic independence, but leading fewer families to cook uh, uh, fresh foods at home uh, because men have not always um, uh, taken over from uh, that um, uh, chore that, that women have been uh, essentially assuming. And increasingly, poor families in particular have less time to cook. Um, in some cases, cooking skills are being lost, although um, uh, Emily O'Brien will, of course, nuance this picture, saying how cooking skills are actually very present within poor families uh, if given a chance and, and given an opportunity. But in many um, um, areas, it is actually becoming more difficult to um, rescue these cooking skills and especially to replace food as an element of our culture central to our existences. And, and finally, as a result of these cultural shifts, as a result of these economic uh, uh, shifts and these technological choices we've made, it is the big players who manage best to capture the imagination of politicians and to suggest uh, policy reforms that will serve their interests 
best. And for politicians, it's of course very convenient to see cheap food as a substitute to more ambitious social programs and redistributive uh, social policies. Um, they feel that uh, they can trust the big players to make the required investments in technologies, in logistics, in order to cater to this demand from the public for cheap food being done uh, on, on the markets. And so these are some of the elements of a quite complex food system, but a food system that has its own uh, logic, uh, given uh, these co-evolutions between these different elements. So, of course, one positive thing about this is that you can try to reform food systems by working on the economy, by working on the technology, by working on consumer tastes, and by working on um, governance uh, reforms to make it more democratic. Um, but in fact, the reality is that it's very difficult to make a change at one level without all the other levels also being addressed. That is not to say there is no hope, and I would like to close by saying that, in my view, the most promising developments in recent years are in two domains. First of all, in the growth of a large number of social innovations in food systems, community-supported agriculture, social groceries, uh, incredible animals, people's fridges, uh, and so on, vegetable gardens in many uh, urban settings, in which people now invest time and energy, and particularly the new generation of food activists that are just not wanting to wait for politicians to come up with solutions, that do not trust the private sector to come up with their own uh, uh, fixes, and they want to do things by themselves. And these social innovations are extremely promising, particularly since this emergence of social innovators in food systems is coupled with uh, a greater interest today of municipalities, cities, in the building of local re-territorialized food systems, as exemplified, for example, by the signing in October 2015 of the Milan Urban Food Policies Pact um, that now brings together about 150 cities across the world, um, um, cities who've pledged to rebuild local food systems, to recreate urban <coughs> rural linkages in order to provide healthier, locally produced food to urban consumers, but also to provide access to markets for local small-scale food producers. And the best and most promising, exciting examples we have of food systems reform in recent years is when social innovations are combined with a political will being expressed at the level of municipalities to bring about this change. For example, um, exemplified here by these mobile trucks that are supported by the Toronto um, uh, municipality, which has a, a, a food policy council established in which the municipality can sh sh understand better what the expectations of Toronto um, residents are concerning the food systems, and has um, in particular tried to combat the phenomenon of food deserts to provide healthy, locally produced food to urban residents in Toronto. I look forward to the other presentations. Thank you. Thank you.
all, after all these heavy investments have been made, many farmers are heavily indebted and uh, that makes a change difficult. Export orientation, many national policies put more, policies put more emphasis on a few commodities for export rather than on providing for the food security and the nutrition that is needed for their own population. The feed the world narrative. We still hear very often in 2050 will be 9, 10 billion people and then implicitly say and therefore we need not only to double production but we have to do that by putting more pesticide, more fertilizers, have a more intensive uh, agriculture to feed the people uh, that will come omitting to say that there are alternatives that can do exactly that. Compartmentalized thinking, uh, whether it's in universities where different departments or even different uh, sections within departments don't talk to each other and don't look at the whole picture, whether it's in uh, government where different ministries don't talk to each other, agriculture is caring about productivity, environment wants to protect the environment, health is trying to repair the problems that have been caused by unhealthy agriculture, etc. Or even in business, uh, the same thing. Short-term thinking, uh, again, um, the people in power want to uh, show a result within the term before the next election and that is making it very difficult to invest in long-term solutions. The same for the private sector which is more and more financial, financialized and relying on, on investment capital. They have to show a short-term return on investment otherwise the uh, shareholders will move away from the company. And finally, measures of success, uh, as long as we continue to uh, only talk about kilos per hectare or tons per hectare or economic uh, income without looking at all the other dimensions, it will be very difficult to bring about change. And the final one that is really uh, probably the most, uh, the, the most difficult one to address and the most important one is a current concentration of power in our agricultural and food systems. On the production side, whether we talk about the seed market, the fertilizer sales market, <coughs> agrochemical market, grain trade, or uh, R&D in poultry or pigs, for example, just a few companies control the vast majority of these markets and their power is enormous in setting policies, in influencing the policies that are being set by countries. On the transformation and retail side, uh, you see many colorful brands in your supermarket, but when you look at the number of companies that are behind that, they are also a fairly small number, uh, and they all have a common interest in maintaining uh, the supply of large amounts of uh, cheap commodities to enter into the transformation um, industry. We also produced a report last year that addresses this issue of concentration, it's called Too Big to Feed, uh, which explains the results <coughs> of what is going on today uh, with the mega mergers of large uh, companies, and I uh, recommend you also uh, this uh, very interesting reading. So what we need to do in order to address uh, these complex problems is address each of these lock-ins uh, and uh, do that in, in a concerted way by trying to fix just one problem uh, won't do the trick. We have to really tackle all of them at the same time and that requires a real paradigm shift and not just some uh, fixes on the margin. So in the report uh, we address a number of uh, recommendations, we include a number of recommendations on uh, how to move forward uh, towards sustainable food systems and, and um, manage this uh, paradigm shift, realizing that a lot of the solutions will be locally dependent. There is no silver bullet or one single solution that can be adopted everywhere. And the finding and identifying the solutions has to be done by involving uh, people in the form of, of a real food democracy. Now, 
the first area that needs to change is really to develop new indicators for sustainable uh, food systems. What is currently happening is uh, still, uh, I'm an agronomy uh, graduate and I was told that what matters is, is maximizing yield per hectare or eventually productivity per worker or income. And at the national level it's GDP growth that is an objective per se. Does that matter to society? What we really should be measuring is the things that matter to society and to the people to have nutrient content that is produced and being made available to the people that need it. It's total outputs, including biomass produced. It's resource efficiency. It's ecosystem services delivered by the system, livelihood resilience, and social equity. So, a number of recommendations uh, to conclude. I will not go through all of them in detail, but just highlight a few. One of the major problems we have today is that there is a lack of investment in the uh, public uh, sector into developing models of agriculture that are sustainable. Uh, a lot of it is done now in the form of public-private partnerships where, in fact, the public sector is uh, subsidizing uh, the private sector to develop technologies that are leading us to the problems that we have just been this describing. Uh, using public procurement as a way to uh, um, develop the market for healthy, uh, sustainable food, to uh, strengthen the movement that are pushing in for, for change, mainstream, mainstream also agroecology and this more system thinking in education and research, and uh, as was mentioned already by Olivier, the large number of initiatives that are can be put under short circuits uh, that more direct links between producers and consumers uh, are all uh, very important ways to move forward. Now, this approach of agroecological diversified systems does not only address the Sustainable Development Goal 2 about zero hunger, but actually directly contributes to 12 of them, and indirectly actually to all of them. So if you want really to implement the, and, and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals in an integrated way, this is a very important way to contribute to that. And I thank you for your attention. Now we're going to move to a particular kind of national, regional perspective from Yang Hairong, who's going to talk about food security challenges as faced by China. Hello, everybody. Uh, every time when we come together, it impressed me so much how much in common we have our problems. And the problem I'm going to present today um, they are distinctive for China, but not unique, I hope. Um, in addition to uh, being a faculty member at a university, I'm also a volunteer uh, for a small network of food sovereignty in China, so that's what the logo you see here is. Okay, let me begin by first talk about uh, the conditions for food production in China in terms of the general picture. Uh, China's population is about 19% of the world's population. But China per capita arable land um, is only about one-third of the world's average. And uh, Chinese access to water uh, is also about, per, on per capita basis, is about one-quarter of the world's average. Which means that Chinese population is actually needs to produce food in a very tight resource context. Agriculture in China today is about 10% of the GDP, yet it still employs about 36% of the labor. Um, we face, in China, we face food security challenges. Um, and today I'm going to focus on one kind of challenge brought by a particular kinds of development model that China has adopted. In 1980s, uh, among the 30 provinces we have in China, 20, 21 of them actually have enough food, enough surplus food to actually go out uh, to supply other regions. 
But by 1990s, it has been reduced to nine provinces that can comfortably supply extra food to other places. Now we have about five provinces that can do it. And these five provinces are mostly concentrated in the north. Coastal regions, which are more developed, quote unquote, um, more industrialized, in fact, they face a very severe food deficit. And here is a map of the food, it's a food map produced by a, a, a journal in China in 2012. And as you can look at the map, mo uh, the deeper the color is, uh, the more food secure um, the province is. As you can see that the, in the northern part of China, uh, the, that's where the color is the deepest. While the gray and white area, meaning that uh, the gray area means food deficit, severe food deficit, and the white area meaning also food shortage. So this is the kind of situation we're facing in China. It's very uneven. And uh, the problem with this situation is that while food producing, that is Chinese food basket provinces are in the north, China's water resources is concentrated mostly in the south. So what does that really mean? That means that a lot of the provinces in the north, when they produce food, they're producing food with water coming from underground. So we have a difficult problem, contradiction here, in terms of how we plan, uh, locate food production region and our water resource. And as a result of my water mining, in fact, in northern plain China, we're facing very big uh, problem uh, of the land is actually sinking. Okay, how do we come to this problem? The co we come to this problem by pursuing uh, development through the lens of GDP. So we would argue that the GDP focus of oriented development model has created food insecurity in China. And uh, provinces and uh, municipal government, in fact, they have been ranked by GDP. Their performance is evaluated on the basis of GDP. So when you do that, the regions which focus on food production, obviously, they will lag behind. And provinces like Guangdong, which is closest to Hong Kong, will have very high GDP. Now, when, you, when that's the case, the so-called backward regions, they try to catch up. They try to produce more GDP. And how do they do that? Then they would, in fact, transform agriculture land into industrial land. By doing that, then their GDP can double or triple. So you have urban expansion, you have industrial expansion, uh, land to be used for real estate development, land being used for building industrial facilities, and that has been the policy of many, many local governments. And that basically creating the situation that I was talking about. Um, so in short, to plant houses or plant buildings, you get a lot more GDP than, say, plant uh, food crops. Right? So do two different kinds of planting you're doing. And the GDP difference can be in terms of hundreds of times. So you can see the incentive of many local governments wanting to, in fact, have a leap of growth by doing land expropriation for industrial or commercial purposes. And that is the source of our food insecurity. Okay. And along with that, we have the process of migration. So the interior regions, so-called backward regions, are then attracted to more industrialized regions, and then therefore losing agricultural labor. So you have two things going on at the same time, um, again, creating source of food insecurity. Also along with that, we have a policy shift uh, within the Chinese government. Um, up to 1990s, basically Chinese government, the central <coughs> state, or provincial governments are responsible for their own food security, defined as food self-reliance. So the provincial government is responsible for providing, ensuring sufficient staple food for, for the province. Municipal government is responsible for ensuring vegetable supply for the, for the city. So each has its own responsibility. But since uh, 2000, uh, the beginning of the new century, the policy has changed. 
That is, food security is not defined not as self-sufficiency, but defined as access, uh, market access. And also the government had divided China's region, China's provinces, into three kinds of regions. One is food producing region, which they have responsibility in producing food. And then there also there is a food balance region. And the third category of regions is food consumption region. So provinces in the third category of consumption, they are not responsible for self-reliance, further encouraging them turning land from agricultural purposes to industrial purposes. So you have the three things all going on at the same time. Then you have a situation of very uneven uh, food security situation in China. Uh, what we are facing, of course, is the challenge of the development model itself. Now, I'm based in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong has, has most terrible <laughs> food self-sufficiency problem uh, because Hong Kong is not able to, in fact, supply most of its food or vegetables. It heavily relies on uh, imports from mainland China and elsewhere. And Hong Kong is a city that's highly based on real estate development and uh, turning land from agricultural purposes to real estate development. That model has been borrowed by Guangdong province, which is closest to Hong Kong. So we have a situation in China that Hong Kong, uh, Guangdong is learning from Hong Kong, and the rest of China is learning from Guangdong, and as in the process of so-called development. And if that development model uh, does not stop, then the food security problem will deepen in, in China. And so we now face the problem of how do we manage food security then? There's more import now um, that China has been um, carrying out. There's also more dependency, in fact, and uh, Chinese media and Chinese officials to more or less extent has accepted the situation as new normal. Of course, Chinese government still hold on to the concept of food security because of the long history of the Cold War. And, uh, but food security definition in China has narrowed. It used to be food security in the sense of 95% of the foods consumed in China should be produced in China. But now that broad category of food has been narrowed to rice, um, to rice, wheat, and maize, only three crops. Okay. Even that perhaps is facing more challenges. And on top of that, we now just have, quote unquote, completed a trade war between the US and China. And the result of that is that China has been, has been compelled to purchase more food from the US. And uh, that increase will be 30 to 40 percent. So that will make the food situation in China uh, worse, in a sense, uh, creating further dependency. So that's one sort of internal and external contradictions we're actually facing. We're also facing the problems of the imagination of modernization as industrial agriculture. So the problem here we, we, we have here is, um, the other day we're talking about decolonization of food. I think we need to talk, talk about decolonization or modernization. How can we actually imagine a modernization away from the kind of industrial forms of farming which have been developed in a very different context that has already very negative uh, impacts. Interestingly, this year, the central government in China had, uh, had put in ecological civilization into the Chinese constitution. What does that really mean? Um, it's not sure. <laughs> it's not certain. So what we, the contradiction here, we have the continuous momentum of promoting industrial agriculture in China, monoculture, uh, you know, scaling up production, etc. At the same time, then you also have a stream of vision or policy that's now talking about ecological uh, civilization. Um, the ones who are actually quite exciting, uh, the ones who are most exciting, uh, along with this, sorry, along with this, ecological civilization, the central government is also now talking about rural revival. And the ones who are most excited, excited about rural revival, uh, there have been a lot of forums in China discussing this new topic, excited about it, 
are the ones who actually invest in our business. It's the capital that's most interested in the topic. They want to be the new actors in doing rural revival. So that's been a very interesting contradiction and problem. Uh, wouldn't be the villagers, wouldn't be the people who actually have connections with rural areas be, be the main subjects of rural revival. But so far, we have seen that this kind of imbalance. So to conclude very quickly that in China we're facing these kinds of challenges. Uh, the, the old paradigm is still ongoing and still has momentum, a lot of interest that is driving it. Uh, there's also movements or networks that's building from below. You also have the central government seem to have this kind of policy contradictions promoting um, ecological civilization. The content of it is still to be defined. So I think the future is going to be, we're going to uh, be facing very interesting future and a lot of tension, a lot of contradictions, and perhaps a lot of efforts and struggles. Thank you. Um, now let's turn from the largest population country in the world to the locality of Brighton and Hope. And Ellie, over to you. Hello everybody, um, good to meet you all. I'm just going to do a really quick introductory exercise, just because everyone's already been sitting quite a lot, and we already had a big day of it. Could you do something for me? Would you put your hand up, please, if you like chocolate? That's pretty good. You're not going to get this on the webcam. That's about to Just get your hands up if you like chocolate. Can you put your hands up if you like fizzy drinks, please, as well? So everybody who likes chocolate and everybody who likes fizzy drinks, keep your hands up. I've got the mic as well, so I'm not, I'm not judging you. It's, we're all together for this. What about cake? Can you add your hands to the mix if you like cake? Okay, for people watching on the webcam, that's um, pretty much almost everybody. Okay, put your hands down. Can you put your hands up if you also think that... Um, Global, there's a global problem with overconsumption of sugar. <laughs> that is actually everybody in the room, I think. So I'll come back to that, that's our warm up. Um, my name's Emily, I work for an organisation called Brighton Ho Food Partnership. Um, we actually do loads of stuff, there's a lovely video on our website, but unfortunately it lasts six minutes, so I'm not showing it now, but I think we'll be circulating in the presentation, so I'll put a link to it there. Um, it's quite complicated what we do, so I'm going to be really whizzing through it. Do watch the video, it, it says a lot. Um, I'm already quite challenged by doing sort of sustainable food city, whole systems change in eight minutes, so six minutes video is not happening. But in a nutshell, we are, see ourselves as a hub for information, inspiration and for connection around food. So we're a non-profit organisation, um, we're based locally obviously. Uh, can I just have a quick show of hands, does anybody here know Brighton Hope quite well, locally based? Yeah, that's quite a lot of the room. People from further away as well, who's in the UK but not, doesn't know Brighton that well? A few people, and from further again? Yep, some international people as well. So, um, so basically we're locally based. We do some practical stuff, we help people um, learn to cook, we help people learn to eat a healthy diet, to grow their own food, we do a lot of work around helping people to waste less food. What's really important for us, I suppose, is it's great hearing all the problems outlined earlier, all the challenges we face, because we're trying to do that in one city in a sense. So if we work with individuals, so that's people in the, in the city um, who live or work there, we work with groups and organisations, so that's businesses, that's the local authority, that's the community groups, and we also work at a strategy and policy level. And that, that's very important for us that we're working at all those different levels because they're all connected and we have to work at all those to really make a difference. So what we have is a collective city-wide approach to tackling some of the, the problems that have been outlined. Um, so we were the first city in the country to have a city-wide food strategy. That was in 2003. It's now a model that's being replicated around the country. And although I called it a strategy, we're, it's a, we're a very practical organisation. It's a strategy backed up with an action plan. So we have, so it's all about the doing, really. It's about things that different partners in the city that are going to do. And what's really important about that is it's not our plan, we're not doing all we're doing, it's a partnership plan. So we have, it must be a hundred odd partners involved in the delivery around that plan, but on all different kinds of levels. Um, and our theory of change, as it were, is we've heard, you know, so eloquently put how difficult it is to bring about any kind of systems change in food, because it, it depends on 
so many different areas and they're all interdependent. So we try and tackle all those areas all at the same time, but in one small place. So we're like a bit like an experiment, I suppose, for how do we solve some of those problems that have been set out. So our food strategy covers all those areas of food that people have talked about earlier. I'm not going to go through them because my eight minutes. Um, but the idea is if we make a series of very small actions incrementally on all those areas at the same time, then gradually we will bring about systemic change. So just to say a little bit about Brighton and Hope, it's not everybody's local, um, some of you will know this. We're a small city but our population is expanding. Um, we have more people who live in flats than in houses. We also have more, more people living in single person households, so living on their own than virtually anywhere in the UK. Our housing costs are hugely expensive and thinking about Jan's um, talk there, you know, about the, the, the kind of conflict between land for food and land for other uses, our, our land costs are huge here, as anybody, any of the students here who've tried to get accommodation will know. We have about 8 million visitors a year, which has a big impact on our food economy. And on the other hand, we have an amazing food culture in the city. So that's very visible if you are a visitor. It's restaurants and retail. We also have an amazing community food scene. Um, you know, we have 75 growing projects. We have a really active surplus food network with a number of organisations intercepting surplus food. We have 18 food banks, which are mainly community-led. They're not the kind of Trust or Trust franchise model. There's just one of them is Trust or Trust. We have places people share a meal together. We did some research and found half a million shared meals being consumed in our city in a year, which is a lot of shared eating, and, and that forms part of our vision for the city. So, with all that richness, we seem to be a food-rich city. But on the other hand, the thing that you don't see so much when you turn up in the city is there's actually a lot of deprivation in Brighton and Hope. We have some very deprived areas, and we have pockets of deprivation within affluent areas. And in the more deprived areas of the city, you're, on average, you're going to live for 10 years less than in the most affluent areas of the city. So in terms of food inequalities and the related health inequalities, um, that's a huge issue in our city. So I suppose we've talked a bit about some of the kind of structural issues around how you actually do food system change. I suppose for me, one of the other things, barriers that we face, is that until you really look at it, food isn't a thing. It's, it, nobody thinks about food, they think about the little aspects of food. I talked a bit about that in the kind of, um, and they'll talk about that with sort of com um, compartmentalisation, I think. I can't even say it, let alone um, understand it. But I think sometimes there's a number of barriers. Food, it's very, as it's already said, it's very difficult to measure the impact of serious food, like particularly if you're looking at a systemic level and you know, things that interrelate. It, it all connects with everything else, it's so complicated. Food also, just as I say, gets forgotten, and that's where I was going to reference back to our little show of hands at the beginning. We are not separate from the food we eat. We all know that sugar consumption is a problem, but we all love cake, um, and we're part of, of the systems that we're within. We're not separate from it, and sometimes we just forget to think about food. You know, I work on a lot of policy in the city, and it's amazing you look at something like around social care, and I completely forgot about what someone's going to eat. It, it's extraordinary how often it just goes under the radar. And there's also political issues. I mean, a lot of my work over the last few years has been on food poverty. Why would politicians at the moment in this government want to measure food poverty in that country? Because the figures are a disgrace that they will come up with. Why would anybody want to do that? Um, so I suppose what I would say is we put, so the way we work, as I said, is we put food at the centre. Um, and one of the kind of side effects of having your food at the centre is food can become a bit of a lens for other issues. So um, this slide, I don't think you can probably read it in great detail, but um, we, this is around our Food Poverty Action Plan, which was a three-year project um, bringing together different partners to tackle food poverty in the city collectively. A lot of the solutions, which are the little arrows floating in the sea with all the miserable-looking people who are under the water there in the bottom bit of the iceberg, a lot of those are around things like um, living wage, um, fair employment practices, access to welfare benefits, access to housing, particularly in our city. So, in fact, that, that can be an incredibly helpful thing. We call it our food goggles. So you put on your food goggles and you're seeing other issues through a light that everybody gets. Everybody gets food at a fundamental level. So that can be really good that it brings, it, you end up looking wider than food and you have to look wider than food. On the other hand, it can also be a bit of a drawback because we're a food organisation, that's what we do. Should we really, as a food organisation, be worrying about housing costs, about life service provision, even though it's so key to food poverty, welfare benefit levels, those kinds of 
things. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, and I'm, I'm throwing that out there because I was told to bring some challenges. So um, the other challenge is, is just complexity. I think you know that's been a common thread going through all of the all of the things so far. And I did literally write a blog last week because we're refreshing our city-wide food strategy at the moment on how it was actually missing spaghetti. It's what I'm doing. That's my job at the moment. I'm knitting spaghetti. So we're we're having a bit of a. It, it is just so complex. It's actually how do you do it? How do you find the actions? which make the most benefits, which are doable, which have you engaged the right partners to do all that. Um, I'm probably running out of time a bit, but I was going to say some of the other kind of dilemmas that we have, as it were, are around contradictions within trying to, yeah, I've got one minute, trying to reconcile healthy, sustainable and fair, all the things that have been, you know, Olivia in particular outlined so coherently. So the fact is good, good food that is ethically produced and the high environmental standards, by definition, costs more. But at the same time, we have a huge issue with food poverty in our city, and some people can't afford to pay that. So how do you make that into a practical action plan? What do you actually decide to do about that particular issue? And there's also some, um, we've, we've talked about those earlier, so I'll whiz through them, but I suppose one of the things that particularly bugs me is that when it comes to food poverty, so many of the people experiencing food poverty work in the food industry, whether that's in retail, in catering, which is a big employer, you know, hospitality is a big employer in our city, um, in food production as well. So how can we make employers, food employers, be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? So that's a big one. I'll give that one to, to you as well. Um, but we do come up with some answers. I'll just read through that. We've got things like minimum buying standards with the council. Um, there are case studies on all that kind of thing on our website as well. So I think the final thing to say really is that actually, so our food strategy doesn't just seek to address sustainability issues, it's also about social and health and environment and economic issues as well. Um, and what's really important is, I think, as, as again, as it, that's been outlined before, is that we don't look at food with health sitting over there in that corner and the obesity agenda and nutrition and environment over there and agriculture somewhere completely different and poverty and social issues being almost entirely in a very small back corner at the moment. Um, so it's very important we bring those together and that we work in partnership to achieve that. So we're entirely dependent on our partners. We have no control over our food strategy. It's all based on the will of our partners and champions. The other thing to say is sometimes it's really complicated. And what's also really important is that for us, it is actually about a passion and a belief. Sometimes we can't evidence that what we are doing is the right thing. There just isn't the evidence there. You cannot always separate our food. But we know it's right. And we recently did our organisational values as an exercise. And we didn't want to end up with like three words in a lanyard, like they have at the council, where it's something like you know, respect and stuff. We wanted something that really meant something. So I was very pleased that one of our values was we believe in lunch breaks, because that's very important. But the other, so another one that particularly chant is we believe in the power of food. And for us, that's what we do. We, we do the food, and we believe that through food we can bring about systemic change that will have benefits beyond the food system itself. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for bringing this down to the level of individuals and households and the choices they're making and also providing a wonderful illustration both of the power of the municipality, as Olivier outlined, but also some of the challenges of, of doing this. So I think that was a treat. We've seen these issues around the blockages and, sorry, and the potential ways forward. And a number of different scales and in a number of different settings. So what I want to do now, we've got about half an hour, is to open up to questions or comments. Please try and keep them short. Perhaps just briefly say who you are, because we've got a real diversity of people here in the room. And I'll take maybe three or four <coughs> short questions or comments and then come back to the panel to, to respond. And then we'll take another couple of rounds. So who'd like to start? We've got our roving microphones here. So if you just put your hand up. Yep, we've got one over here. Yeah, Hi, thank you all for your presentation today. It's super interesting. Um, my name is Hannah and I'm doing a master's here um, in environment development and policy. 
And um, what was really striking about all of your presentations was that out of all of them, Emmys was the only one who sort of focused more on um, demand side um, solutions to the problem. And um, given the sort of proliferation of literature on uh, the impact of animal agriculture in particular, um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on sort of moving more towards plant-based diets from an industrial uh, context for, you know, making more sustainable food futures. Great question. Okay, who's next? Okay, we can come down here. Is this one from our yeah. online audience? Um, I think this is a question directed for Olivier. Um, what do you think the insights, political bottlenecks from big powerful countries, donors, foundations that don't support promotion of agroecology in a big way? Um, and, and that's Aptab, who's an international development consultant. Good. Okay, so let's have some more hands. There's one here in the middle. Okay, and there's one at the back, right? So we'll come here and then we'll go up to the back. Hi, thank you for your presentations. Um, my name is Nicoletta and I'm a master's student um, at the University of Westminster in London. Um, I was just going to repeat Emily's question actually. Um, how can, I, I definitely agree that we are paying way too little for food that is way too costly in the longer run, uh, but how can we show that if we were to pay the right amount or, the right, or a more expensive um, a cost for this uh, that doesn't affect the, the poorest families and how can we should make it there as well. Thank you. That's, that's great. So I think there's a question right up there at, at the back. Who was it? Was there a hand waving or have I missed it? Oh, maybe it was somebody stretching. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody else who wants to come in on this, this round? Yeah, okay, over here. Hi, my name is Pierre. Um, I work uh, with the private sector. We organize events around um, um, agri tech and food tech innovation and very much engaging um, industry uh, about this question about sustainability and health. And I was uh, really wondering, you know, is there no hope in the private sector uh, you know, to drive these changes and be a force of innovation and, you know, equality and sustainability in health? Right, well let's come back maybe in order and you can pick up the, the questions that were more directed at you but perhaps you might have comments on the others as well. So Olivier. Thank you. So let me say a few words on, on the two first questions. I, I, I shall be glad to, to say a few words on the fourth if, if, if there's no other candidate in the private sector. But on the two first questions, first of all I think the, the, the question of meat consumption and animal protein more generally is one that is very difficult to summarize in a few sentences because the real question is how meat is produced, which um, animals are raised, uh, by which type of farming. In agricultural systems, animals have a function to fulfill and in fact many permanent pastures are very important carbon sinks. We'd be absolutely foolish to put this land into cultivation for the production of crops, given the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that would, as a result, be released in the atmosphere. Um, the real problem, I think, has to do with how industrial livestock production has evolved um, and how animals have been separated from um, uh, from crop production and indeed uh, how forests, animals and, and crops have been separated from one another for the sake of efficiency and uh, parcelization of production. Um, the meat eaters usually are not well informed about how the meat has been produced and that is exactly the kind of information they should get, whether animals have been raised on pastures or instead uh, 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 have been uh, raised in, in, in factories, uh, uh, given non-theoretic uh, antibiotics, for example, and so forth. Um, so that would be my, my answer. I think things are quite complex, uh, but, but uh, I think although we need, for health reasons and for environment reasons, to reduce our consumption of meat, I would not say that uh, completely um, shifting away from, from, from uh, meat in diets is, 
is the magic bullet. Um, on the second question concerning international development agencies, including philanthropic foundations and, um, uh, and, and other donors, um, I agree with the diagnosis of the assessment implicit in the question that not enough is being done for agroecology. And I think one major reason for this is that agroecology does not look like something modern. It is usually perceived by people who are not fully informed about what it means, it's usually perceived as something that is backwards, that is a return to a romanticized past, that is, you know, uh, lowly uh, productive uh, um, and, and um, uh, not very efficient ways of, of producing food. And I think it's in part because agroecology is not understood as what it is, which is the 21st century science, which is highly resource efficient, very intensive in knowledge, although using fewer external inputs and thus uh, fewer fossil energies. And I think those promoting agroecology have to accept part of the, of the responsibility for this wrong image that agroecology has. Now, I'm not saying that there are not other reasons why agroecology is not more supported. Of course, development agencies increasingly focus their efforts on what is the most promising for the private sector's development in the future. And yes, there are fewer gains for fertilizing, for fertilizer producing industries or for seed companies. Uh, there are fewer gains to expect from teaching farmers how to do more with less external inputs, how to develop farmers' uh, seed systems, how to develop low input, uh, low input farming. Um, but um, it's not only about this, it's also about the image that agroecology has that I think we have to be very uh, attentive to correcting sometimes. Um, so that's what I would like to answer to the two first questions. So I'll take on <coughs> some of the aspects of the, the two next ones. Uh, the first one about uh, does paying the full price for food going to affect uh, the poorest people? Well, if, if that was done in that way, yes. But of course, <coughs> what we are seeing is that today the society is paying in a different way, including the poor people. Uh, the, the health bills of countries are in the hundreds of billions and uh, the, the, the cost of some of the environmental damage that is being done, uh, the high cost of purifi purifying water for example that has been polluted or, or other environmental dimensions that are paid for by government now that are paid by taxes. So there has to be a rethinking of our model uh, that is of course has to make sure that we don't uh, penalize the poorest people. But it, this model is uh, something that is achievable if we <coughs> rethink the whole system. And so it's not just increasing the price of food, uh, it has to be uh, an internalization of the cost, but with the changes in uh, how government budgets are, are made up and where they spend the money in preventive way rather than in curative ways and ensuring of course that there are safety nets that, that uh, prevent people from falling through the cracks. The, um, the question about the private sector, um, I think the private sector has a role to play. Uh, what, what I was mentioning in, in the graphic there is essentially the input uh, su the suppliers of input in the agricultural system uh, where we are advocating for a system of production as Olivier just said that is much lower in inputs and so I would certainly not expect many initiatives to go in that direction <coughs> from the input suppliers uh, but that's not the whole private sector uh, the, the, the whole transformation and, and commercialization sector has an important role to play or can play a very important role and has to be encouraged to play that role and I think the consumers or the eaters have an important role to play first with the way they, um, they buy the food, which food they buy 
and second, by putting pressure also on, uh, on policymakers to uh, put the right incentives and the right regulations when necessary uh, to move towards a more sustainable food system. So it's not that uh, it's against the private sector in general, uh, but in a model that is more sustainable, I must say that I see little room for a pesticide company that sells the kind of pesticides that are poisoning us. Excellent. So, um, Haram, would you like to pick up on any of these from the Chinese perspective? Well, private sector possibly, or even on diet and plant-based diets. I don't know about you. Uh, maybe I'll address the question about private sector. Uh, in China, in the Chinese context, and perhaps it can be generalized, we know that uh, much of the profit uh, of the food chain actually has been um, going towards, uh, not in farming, in fact, uh, has been upstream and downstream. And that's where the capital is actually concentrated. I've not seen a case of, in fact, um, more of a sharing of the income or profit uh, with farming, with people actually who do farming. So I think the reality is, is right there. Uh, for us, uh, through Sovereignty Network in China, we actually advocate of how uh, that all of these infrastructure of uh, ag agriculture production needs to be in public hands. Um, not just sort of the land, not just the land, but see, of course, an entire infrastructure should be in public as public resource itself. But I have seen that uh, some villages in China, these are collective villages who are actually pulling um, farming together. Uh, they have worked with some companies which happen to be private. And the way they're working with them is not to surrender to those companies, but actually set the terms. Because the land is in the hands of the, these villagers. Uh, they are able to set five-year term. Uh, to enforce a certain kind of technology transfer. And after five years, the term will be renewed, uh, be reviewed, and uh, perhaps you know, the, the, the term should be changed. So I think there's certain kind of control, if there is enough solidarity among the producers, there's certain kind of control they can exercise in vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. external actors. Very interesting, and we might want to come back to the extent to which that kind of action is feasible in the Chinese context, whereas it might not be in other structures of liberal democracy, say. But I'm going to turn to Emily, because there was a specific question about food poverty, which would be great to hear some more from you all. But you might want to pick up on some of the others as well, from a Brian's perspective. <laughs> I bet you do. Yeah. Um, yeah, in terms of the question about how can we reconcile um, affordability and sustainability, in a sense. Um, that's obviously one of the dilemmas that we're thinking about all the time. From our food strategy approach, um, uh, uh, what we try and do is always look for the overlaps. Um, so, I really, like, again, a, a bit like Olivia was saying, sometimes food things are not that high tech and they're not that glamorous, but have you ever thought about portion sizes? Portion sizes are brilliant because they cut right across sort of fair, sustainable, and the health agendas as well. If you are not cooking too much food in the first place, it's better for your health, the obesity agenda. It's also better around food waste, um, the sustainability agenda. And it means that you can afford to spend more on the food that you are buying. Um, you're not wasting any food for start if you're on a tight budget, but also you're freeing up some of your budget for quality. So that, there are some really simple, we, I mean, it, it, it's a bit clear, isn't it? It's like, oh, we're going to start with the portion size. But what we do is that's a kind of really simple example of what we try and do when we look for the crossovers across all areas. Um, on, a more, on a kind of deeper level as well, our city has been kind of really held up as a, as a, as a model that now other places are getting some funding through a national programme to try and do something similar, which was about having a three-year food poverty action plan. And we very much, with that action plan, looked at tackling the underlying causes of food poverty. So it wasn't just about food banks, basically. I think if you pick up a newspaper and think of food poverty, it tends, in this country, it tends to be seen as synonymous with food banks and that real crisis end of food poverty. Um, so what we were very much wanted to do was the stuff that we talked, that I kind of briefly touched on in that slide. It was about looking at things like, you know, fair wages, um, uh, being living, having living wage employers. Um, and, we, you know, Obviously, it's really hard to kind of try and tackle those things. They're massive, aren't they? House, house prices are a huge issue, um, housing costs. But we felt it was very important that, that we did make that effort and that that was the focus. It's about dealing with the upstream underlying reasons why people are in food poverty and not just picking up the pieces and supporting food banks to do that better. 
Um, so that, that's on the food property. So right, if I just mention about plant-based diets as yeah, well. Um, but just to say, yeah, from, from a practical point of view, we very excitingly we've just opened a community kitchen for the city, which is a real kind of focal point for community cookery. And we will be running plant-based cookery classes there. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in cooking in whatever way to have a look at what we're running there, because it's quite exciting. And obviously the profit-making classes we run will subsidise the classes that we run for low-income people as well. So it's a, a lovely model. And there is some brilliant stuff going on there, so do come and visit. It's just below the station on Queen's Road on the left. Um, in, a, in a more strategic, so that's sort of what we're doing on a practical level. On a more strategic level, within our food strategy, we um, do include um, an action, or in our new version, we will include an action around um, helping people to choose more plant-based diets for environmental reasons. It does get very complicated though, just to echo what Olivier says. I'm so pleased that I'm just so in agreement with him on everything because he's such an important and strategic person. You know, it's amazing that we just totally sit the same way. Because actually, it's not that simple about me, is it really? Because if you think about where Brighton Hove is, what's our food bowl? What lies around the city? It's the South Downs, isn't it? It's chalk gray, it's chalk land, which is historic grazing land, and it's rubbish for growing on. Where I live, I actually live in the South Downs, I don't live within the city. And we have a field at our back door, and it is, it's, like, it's virtually grown on hydroponically, to be honest. The soil is so poor on chalk down land, which is why it's so good for, you know, wildflowers and things, that it, it, it's incredibly intensively managed. It's sprayed three times a year, I think, with glyphosate. It's all about adding fertilizer. It's so industrialized. So if you're telling me that to eat the wheat off that field is better than to have a nice bit of lamb that's grazed that field, then I'm sorry, that's not the case. Um, so it's, it's never simple. So what we're struggling with at the minute is how we manage to put in our strategy in a way that is comprehensible to the person in the street, who is also part of our strategy, not just you know people in high polluting places. How on earth, it's about how on earth do you explain it? Yes, please eat less meat, but it's not just about eating less, it's also about thinking about what you have and, and then not just completely lose people in, in the whole complexity. Like, as I said, we're just, it's another area of missing spaghetti. I've got something about private sector as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know and let you come back. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, that was, that was fantastic. And this message that actually context really matters is complicated, but actually it also very much depends on context, and it is coming through very clearly. So let's have, we've probably got time for another, another round. So another quick three or four, and then I'll come back to the panel, and then I think we will have to stop. So somebody in the middle here, in the stripes, and now we've got, okay, now the questions are coming, you're all getting going. So we'll go to the, the lady in the stripes. <laughs> <laughs> and then perhaps come to the, the row in front there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I have two questions, but maybe I should... Um, in the context of synergies that our ecology also looks for, we also always hear about the agriculture ministries getting involved. Have you heard about some successful examples of other sector ministries, I don't know, like the energy ones, when you mentioned about the paradigm, paradigm shift from changing the metrics? towards looking for some other KPIs as biomass production. Um, like taking into account some other goals as energy poverty as well. And my second question would be according like regarding agroecology, how to scale it up? Like how to talk to taxpayers maybe in their language according to the costs of not changing the paradigm, um, for making it also addressable from the top bottom, rather from the bottom on, bottom up only. Okay. Great. So that's two there. Now, maybe just in front here. Yeah. We've got a microphone with a microphone. Well, thanks for your excellent speech. And my question is for Harold. So you just addressed the problems and challenges in food systems, uh, for our food system in China. And you criticize the industrial industrial pattern in Chinese agriculture. And my question is: so, what's your ideal agricultural paradigm for China? And is it possible for China to transform uh, the current agricultural pattern to the collective agriculture that you 
mentioned just now, which based in which based our rural community. And if so, how can it uh, come true? Yeah. Okay. Great. Why don't you pause the microphone there? And then I'm afraid we've only got time for one more question after this. So here we go. Uh, thank you, Tom Lyons. I'm a consultant and also a graduate of IDS. Um, first of all, thank you very much to all four speakers for the extremely good and interesting presentations. Uh, one question has, uh, one rather important question, I think, in this whole complex has only been sort of rushed against, and that's the income of the people who actually produce food, uh, not as mostly farmers. Um, now, obviously, in poorer parts of the world, um, that is well known as an area of poverty, but it's also elsewhere in the world. In this country, agricultural laborers, as throughout the world, are well known to be very poorly paid, but also most of farmers. The average British farm or English farm actually lost money from agriculture, from agriculture activities alone, if you take out subsidies, uh, over the last three years. Uh, agricultural, um, and the, the, the English government is actually, the, the, at least for English agricultural policy, of course, the, the, there are talk, there's talk with the new agricultural policy of 25 to 30 percent, or possibly more, of English farms going out of business. Um, what can be done to remedy this, pro this, this problem? Okay. Great, and I think we'll just have one more, so we've got one more question from our online audience. Um, this is to all the panel, um, it's from Marlia Ellington, um, and she, um, Marlia says, there are a few young people um, from the younger generation entering the ag agriculture industry how do we plan to change and transform the food system without this huge generation? Um, and do you bring the government or organisms on involving the younger generation and making it attractive to be a farmer again? Okay. Great. So that's actually a few that are focusing much more on the production side, which is fine. So I'm going to turn back to the panel, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to ask you to be quick and use this as an opportunity also to make any quick last remarks. So pick up on any of these questions and any last remarks that you'd like to make. <coughs> okay, so three remarks. Um, first, on the, the first of the, your two questions that you asked, uh, the, the first thing, I think it's indeed part of the solutions we are looking for is to develop a, a cross-sectorial food policy or food strategy that allows different ministries to contribute because I do not think that solutions reside only in one, in one department. That is in part why local um, actors, municipalities, regions have um, for the moment proven to be the more dynamic uh, locus, the center of gravity if you wish in, in food system reform is because it's easier to achieve integration of different sectoral strategies at the local level than at higher levels of governments. I think it's really key and, um, for example, uh, uh, ministries in charge of social protection, uh, ministries in charge of agriculture, of rural development, of land zoning, uh, um, uh, of trade, uh, should combine their efforts towards developing uh, uh, tools towards sustainable food systems. Otherwise, uh, it shall be indeed very difficult to, to achieve. This is why IPSUD, for example, has been supporting the development of the food policy at EU level, because that is one level at which the sectorialization is indeed impeding change. And your second question was about um, the, the scaling up of agroecology. Um, and I do think, as you implied in your question, that demonstrating the costs of inaction is really important. We just had recently a report published by uh, Teeb Ag, which is a group of researchers assessing the environmental costs of industrial food systems. We at this food um, prepared a report on the health costs of food of industrial food systems. And I, I think if we had um, a, a tool to calculate the huge costs um, of um, the current systems as they have developed that are largely built not to the end consumer today but to the taxpayer and to future generations, it could be a very powerful signal sent to policymakers. Uh, to my knowledge, such a magic figure has not yet been calculated, 
Um, it is very complex to make such a calculation, but I think it certainly would be worth doing to show how much we could spare um, immediately and in the future if we made this shift to agroecological food systems. Um, my third and final remark has to do with farmers' incomes and um, the, the question from Tim Lyons, but also uh, because it's, in, it's, it's connected uh, how to attract a new generation of farmers uh, in the future. I think it's, of course, connected. Access to land needs to be facilitated by reducing the speculation on land and perhaps developing a system as they have in France with the ability for municipalities to preempt land in order to allow younger generations of farmers to have access to land at affordable conditions. But also we need um, to um, support all families in having access to uh, uh, good locally produced food by strengthening social protection, increasing the minimum wage, and uh, not allowing um, uh, cheap food at the expense of farmers' incomes to be the default solution for low-income families. And this is precisely why uh, social protection um, um, employment legislation should be part of the solutions towards sustainable food systems. And we need to accept that maybe we are not today paying the right price for the food that we consume. Just one more word about the, the first issue about the synergies between various sectors or integration between various sectors. That's also important at the local level, not just at national policies, but at the level of a landscape, to have an integrated landscape management approach where the people uh, coming from different sectors work together to find the solutions that are uh, going to serve the needs of all of them in, in the best uh, possible way. Um, the question of income of farmers, uh, the figures that were recently coming out in, in France also, not just the poor countries, but where uh, more than a third of the farmers get less than 350 euro per month, which is one third of the minimum wage, uh, is, is a, a, a drama. I mean, that cannot go on like that. About young people, what we see is actually young people going into agriculture, virtually all of them are going into alternative models of agriculture, about agroecology, about organic production, about permaculture, uh, and, and I think that's where we have a chance to bring in new people, because the model, of, the dominant model of, of, of conventional agriculture has transformed farmers into tractor drivers, because the suppliers of, of seed, of fertilizer, of pesticide are telling them which varieties to seed, which fertilizer to apply at what stage, which pesticide to apply at what stage, and there's no more innovation required from them, and at the end they get not properly paid anyway. So I think there's nothing attractive in, in that model, but a, a model where you have more direct links with consumers, where there is a much more of a commonality, and where um, you're relying more on local innovation and, and participatory uh, finding solutions with, uh, with researchers also, I think that can make uh, agriculture again more, more attractive. And I think this, this idea, and that's something where everybody here can really contribute, is to debunk this idea when you hear somebody saying, we have to feed the world and implying and therefore we need to continue to intensify more the agriculture, is to say, that's not true. There are alternatives that do work. And I, I think, um, well, I, I think I'll leave yeah. it at that. I could go on. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Carol, would you like to pick up? I was following the question about China, but also about young people in um, back to the countryside. Um, so, today in China, I think the major actors pushing for or practicing industrial agriculture is big are big farmers as well as uh, corporations. Um, so to transform that into something more collective um, agriculture, then basically face the power of the capital. Uh, you also face the power of the ideology um, promoting uh, this kind of arrangement. So I think to, that kind of transformation has to be part of the broader transformation of relations production and social relations in China in general. 
Uh, so I have always come to see food sovereignty struggle as part of the broader social struggle um, itself. Now, the collective village, collective agriculture itself, can also be industrial agriculture. So I think that's something we have to also pay attention to. But there are um, a few collective villages in China which are now switching to agroecology, and that's very, very interesting. And they also they have been pra uh, practicing is something which had been promoted in socialism period, socialist period earlier, which is they're combining agriculture together with small-scale <coughs> industrialization, in this case, food processing. Because they bring food processing much closer to the location of production. And also combining that with service sector development. So what they are doing is actually not reducing the countryside rural areas to agriculture itself. They are actually bringing industry, bringing service sector, actually making it much more holistic kinds of economic development. Now when you have that, it's actually much easier to attract young people back to the village. They no longer see it, they're coming back just to agriculture, they're coming back to more um, um, comprehensive kind of development. So if we could have that route, I think um, we wouldn't have to worry about young people not coming back. But to get there, we need a much bigger, uh, a lot big, bigger social transformation itself. Last words. Yeah, I'll try and make it brief. But, um, I think quite a lot of the questions relate to each other. I'm interested to answer the question about low wages in agriculture. I think that's a problem right across the food system, including in production. Um, and I think there's a couple of things going on. One, of course, is around the kind of perverse incentives there are at the minute around agriculture. And, and in terms of what we do about it, I think obviously Brexit we would hope would be an opportunity for that. Um, and actually, the response that we put in as an organisation to the food and farming consultation. Um, actually focused on wages um, and this line we have around needing to make sure food employers are part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, and I do, you know, obviously I'm hopeful that that will lead to something, although I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think the other side of it as well, the other reason why young people don't want to go into farming, and as indeed that relates to other food areas as well, is food in our country isn't seen as a proper career, it's a bit of a dead end job, and I think farming is seen a bit like that. Also, um, retail, um, they tend to be low paid, low status, catering in particular, food. And so I suppose as a city, one of our responses is to try and encourage the idea that food should be a career. Um, I think we're more focused on, because we're a city, it's less about the farming side, but it does relate. Um, so there's something around making sure that it's seen as a proper profession and that apprenticeships can do things like, rather than just be about how to flip a burger, it's actually about how you can put, bring out a value into food by looking at things like local sourcing and those sorts of things, which, and obviously the partner who we will be working on that with is Plumpton, who are also very good at um, you know, running apprenticeships and training around really good agricultural training. You do everything from you know, grapes to bees through Plumpton. Um, and I think, um, I suppose just to touch really, is it right to just say one more thing really quickly? I mean, the other thing is I think it's not just about how our food is produced, but what happens to it after it's produced. So just coming back to the private sector sort of thing, the previous question, I think it's very, very important that mainstream retailers are part of the solution as well, and part of us, and we can't leave the private sector behind. Because um, so as our food strategy has a double front <coughs> approach, we encourage alternatives, so alternative retail, you know there's things like alternative supermarkets going on in the city, there's loads of really exciting initiatives, um, we have all sorts of stuff going on. So those alternatives are important, but we have to recognise that most people in most places buy most of their food in the supermarket, I think it's at least 80%, I think, I'm not quite sure of the figures. So unless we work with mainstream retailers around their practices, um, that doesn't do anything really, you know, we have to engage with them as well, so we have an ambition to do two um, projects with mainstream retailers and caterers over the next five, uh, sort of, well, ideally over the next four years, and we're looking for partners around that at the minute. It's quite likely that at least one of those will be focused around food waste, because they're all jumping over themselves at the moment around food waste and food packaging as well. <coughs> so um, we always try and push when the door is open, and then you never know what you can do afterwards. Wonderful. Well, I think that's been a hugely rich discussion and we could clearly go on for the rest of the evening, but we can't. Um, just a few kind of points that struck me as we were talking. Firstly, that sustainable food 
is a set of issues, but it's also a lens through which we can understand all sorts of other things that are going on in our economies and societies. Secondly, I think we've heard some really important messages about the need for joined up thinking, action, policies, whether we're talking about linking across sectors um, or connecting what's going on around food to deeper structures of social policy, social transformation, economy. I think that's a really important message. We've also heard a great deal about complexity, and I think the knitting spaghetti example is a, is a great one. Um, but yet, complexity is not a bar to action. Um, and I think we've heard both, both locally and globally about some really important routes in to making a difference, not being overwhelmed by complexity. Um, and particularly the, the power of what's going on locally, amongst groups, amongst collectivities, um, beyond simply the state and the market. Um, and some really wonderful examples from different settings. And I think what I also take from this is the opportunity actually for mutual learning. Um, and I think it's been really interesting to have had both the context of China and indeed of Brighton, where we might be wanting to make some connections. What is it about um, collective models of agriculture in the Chinese context that we can learn from in Brighton or in other parts of the UK? And finally, I mean, we've been talking in different ways about political economy. I think there are also some really important messages here about what you could call culture and excitement. And I think the question of young people and farming really brings this to life. How can one make alternative pathways in food systems be attractive, be exciting, be things that people want to do? And ultimately, this whole area should be one that's about engaging people at the level of hearts as well as at the level of minds, um, and actually creating alliances for the future which can build, build bridges and actually get people working together for alternatives. So um, please join me in thanking very much the, the panel, all of you who have asked questions, our online audience, and may this conversation continue because it really could not be more important. Thank you.